Okay, so this is, uh, we're going to talk about alterations in cardiovascular function, and specifically, this is part one, so there are going to be two parts. Uh, this covers vascular disorders, so diseases of vessels, including atherosclerosis, and then we're going to talk about myocardial infarction um, or uh, unstable angina. We're going to cover all the anginas, but that's where we're going with this. Now there's something really important about understanding cardiovascular the system and some of these diseases that we're going to be talking about because you really have to know the movement of blood through the heart and there are a couple of rules you can remember the right side of the heart is always going to be deoxygenated blood the left side is going to be oxygenated so if we're talking about the left side then if you remember that oxygenation happens from the lungs, then you know that blood going to the left side of the heart, and this is going to be left like your left hand, like if you're looking at somebody, so uh, somebody facing you, their left side is on your right. So, um, but, but you know that blood coming from, or if it's oxygenated blood in the left side, that it's got to be coming from the lungs. Okay, so, so we remember that because that's going to be important because if you have a problem like a stenotic valve, mitral valve here or something, the blood is going to back up into the lungs and that's going to cause congestion. So we need to know that. And then if we have, you know, the same thing going on over on the right side of the heart, then we know that it's going to back up into the body. Okay, so blood can so that can cause some edema. So it's really important that you understand exactly how blood is flowing through the heart, the bicuspid valves, those those kinds of things. Okay, so I'm not going to go through this one by one, but uh, I just wanted to emphasize that. Okay, so normally the heart regulates itself. So what's that mean? Well, we know that it has autorhythmic cells, so it beats. But there's another little aspect of the heart controlling itself, and that is that when the heart is very small, okay, so, um, or not when the heart is very small, but when, when you have not very much blood in the heart, so it's not stretched out very much, it has kind of a weaker contraction, okay, and that's because the actin and myosin are kind of pushed together, and maybe some of those myosin motor proteins are kind of, kind of hanging off the other side, so it doesn't have a good grip. Is, is one way to look at it, the, the actual muscle and what's going on in the muscle. But it's only right here in the middle that it's got a really strong contraction, not really in the middle, but, but when, it's, when it's fully lined up, uh, kind of like if you were trying to pick something up and your, and your bicep was really outstretched, you don't have as much strength, and, but you do when it's kind of, kind of closer to the center and it gets increasingly stronger the more blood that's in it. Now I'm talking about the heart, now not the bicep. But when the heart has, gets more and more blood, it has a stronger and stronger contraction, which makes sense and it really fits with, with what's going on. The more blood that's in it, the stronger it's got to contract to get a good portion of that blood out. Okay, But that's only true up to a point. At some point it gets so stretched out that it actually loses its contractile strength. Okay. So that's what this graph is kind of showing. More blood in the ventricle, the stronger the contraction, but only up to a point, which is what this last thing says right here at the bottom. The more blood, the more forceful the contraction, but only up to that point. Uh, so this is referred to as the Frank Starling Law. I'm not really worried about you knowing that term, but that's, uh, you probably maybe heard that before, but that's what that is. So, um, so let's see, if we go through here, more blood, is the amount of stretch caused by blood entering the ves ventricles. Now, when we, when we talk about blood moving into the heart, um, there's a certain amount, so we're going to kind of stick specifically to the ventricle. So that blood has to be, lo or that the ventricle has to be loaded, I'm using that word on purpose, it has to be loaded with blood. Now, if, if you're having circulatory problems or there's some kind of stenosis or something like that, you're not going to be able to get very much blood in there. Okay, So we call that preload, how much that ventricle is preloading with blood before it contracts. Okay, So that's going to you know, indicate how, how stretched out that ventricle is and then the force of contraction later on. But, but we have to understand this term preload because that's going to be the volume of blood that officially preloads that ventricle. Okay, so now it's preloaded, let's say everything's working right, and, and it's ready to, to contract and get that blood out of there. Okay, so that's preload, pre and we like to just 
you know, simply say the preload is volume. That goes, it's a little different when we're talking about afterload, okay? Because now, now you've got that ventricle filled with blood up to a certain point, and now you have to contract to get rid of that blood, okay? But let's just say that your aorta is a little bit stenotic. Maybe it's clogged from atherosclerosis or something. And so it's not the heart, the ventricle, when it contracts, has to push really hard. That's going to be a high afterload. Okay, so we say that afterload is pressure. Afterload doesn't have anything to do with the volume. Uh, it's going to have to do with, with pressure. So volume is going to be other things like... Um, you know, your cardiac output, stroke volume, those kinds of things. So afterload, we like to say, is pressure. So if everything is fine and this aorta is perfectly wide open, then you're going to have a lower afterload. It's not as much, not as much pressure required by the heart. Now, if the heart is constantly trying to push against kind of closed up valve or closed up valves too, but closed up uh, arteries, then then you can have it's going to have to work harder. That higher afterload is going to cause an increase in uh, it may be muscle tissue, you might have some hypertrophy of the ventricle, something like that. Okay, so afterload is pressure, so keep those, keep those separated. I would have named them differently, but I didn't name them, so, um, so we're kind of stuck with it. So higher afterload leaves blood in the ventricle after contraction. A lot of times if the, if the heart isn't able to pump all that out, then there's going to be more blood left in there, and that's going to be kind of an important concept when we talk about uh, heart failure. So it can be caused by aortic valve issues, high blood pressure, which we come back to maybe these, uh, you know, plaques forming or uh, kind of your vessels being kind of closed up a little bit. So another important thing, or can be important, is that the different drugs affect preload or afterload differently. So if you understand this concept, then you probably understand preload and afterload. If if you take, if you have a really high preload, so a lot of blood is moving into that ventricle to begin with, that could indicate that you have high volume. So you could take a diuretic, which you, which would make you urinate more, and the volume of blood would be reduced, and therefore it would reduce your preload. Okay. Um, now, afterload, since that's the pressure at which it's pushing, you could take a vasodilator, and a vasodilator may open that valve up a little, or that vessel up or the arteries up all over the place and that's going to reduce your afterload okay all right so hopefully hopefully that makes sense so let's talk about some diseases of veins there's a, there are a couple of terms here a uh, a thrombus is essentially a clot okay because thrombocytes are platelets so uh, a thrombus is essentially a clot a blood clot that remains attached to the vessel wall now that can grow and it can cause a uh, it can cause restriction, ischemia, or restriction of blood flow. And that can occur in the arteries, or they can occur in the veins. And embolism is different because that is that would be as though the thrombus broke free and then caused a clot somewhere else or clogs up something somewhere else. So we define an embolism as a bolus of matter because it really doesn't it really doesn't have to be a blood clot it can be any of these things down here uh, but it's something that's been dislodged so dislodged thrombus air bubble uh, that can happen if you get air in your in your artery somewhere amniotic fluid can do it aggregate of fat bacteria cancer cells foreign substance really anything that ends up in your bloodstream moves and then and then causes a, uh, a uh, I want to say a clot, but it causes it to uh, to block blood flow somewhere else. So we call that an embolism. Okay, so going back to arterial versus venous uh, of of arterial and venous thrombi. So um, what causes these these clots to sort of form on the on the walls of arteries or veins? So uh, most common cause of arterial roughening of the tunica media by atherosclerosis. And we're going to talk about atherosclerosis. Um, so arterial occlusion can cause ischemia, pain, and then we'll see something called angina, which is, which is pain when you experience that in the coronary arteries. Venous, so venous, most common cause, something called thrombophlebitis, which is an inflammation or an inflammatory process that happens in the, in the veins leading to a thrombus. 
and that's uh, just obstructed venous drainage. So remember the veins, and I and I usually talk about talk about the legs when I talk about this. This is a leg, and and the veins are trying to send blood up back to the heart. Okay, and it's doing this everywhere. It's doing it from the head and from the arms too. But the leg scent tends to be where it can be a problem. And so if you if you have an obstruction of venous flow in the legs, then what happens is that blood can kind of pool down here and build up and cause increase in pressure and edema. Okay, so that's one of the one of the uh, noticeable things that happens with a thrombus that happens in the veins. Okay, so if a clot is dislodged from a leg vein, is it more likely to cause a stroke or a pulmonary embolism? So that's where you have to kind of go back to that. How does the heart work? How does the circulatory system work? And you have to say, okay, well, if blood moving from the legs is going back to the heart, okay, so there's your heart here. We'll make it red then it's going back to the to the right side and then from the right side because it's deoxygenated means it has to go to the lungs okay so since since these vessels as blood is moving from the leg veins and then back to the heart the vessels are actually getting larger and larger and larger because more blood is moving in and and uh, so those those veins get larger and so you're not really going to if you throw a clot from from down here in the leg somewhere it's not really going to get find a place that's small because it's going to move right through the heart. The heart has big chambers. So what's normally going to happen is it's going to get all the way to the lungs and then those vessels start to get smaller. Okay, So you have arteries and then you have arterioles and then you, it kind of can form into uh, capillaries. And then that, if so if you have a clot, then chances are it's going to uh, it's going to be as it approaches the lung, and depending on the size of it, it can it can block off a chunk, a sizable chunk of the uh, of the lungs, of the circulatory system of the lungs. Okay, so so that would be the answer. So it's going to be uh, more likely to cause cause a pulmonary embolism if you have a uh, a vessel or a thrombus break free in the in the leg area or even in the arm, but it's more common in the leg. Okay, so there's also something called chronic venous insufficiency. Now that's just kind of a blanket term and it means that you're not getting adequate venous return okay, over a long period of time because it's chronic. okay, And that can be because of varicose veins or veins that aren't working right, um, that are, um, that are uh, somehow compromised, or valvular incompetence, the valves themselves aren't working. Now we have these muscle valves uh, or muscle pumps, I guess. And and so when you, and this happens in everybody, and this is kind of how we get that blood flow. Because remember, in the legs or in veins, pressure is pretty low. And so it's really kind of difficult to get that blood to go uphill back to the heart. And so as we move around and as our muscles contract, we have this system made up of these valves. Okay, And they're one-way valves. And so that means that when blood is when these when these muscles constrict then that's going to push against that increase the pressure and since these valves are only one way that means that the only the top valve will open so blood might try to go back down but this valve is closed for that direction and so it's going to be rejected and it's going to move up and so that's what's constantly happen when, happening when we're moving around is we're kind of squeezing those veins. And because of those one-way valves, when we squeeze it, it forces the blood to go back up. So it doesn't rely necessarily on the heart. The problem is that if you're not moving, like if you're sitting in an airplane or something like that, this is where this happens a lot, uh, we get something called deep vein thrombosis. Okay. So deep vein thrombosis happens when, when you have a, a clot that forms. And because you don't have blood flowing, you don't have it moving, and a lot of times when blood is static, or we call it stasis of blood, then and it's not really moving, then it can start to form thrombi or clots. Okay, it can start to form a thrombus, and then that can uh, that can damage. Uh, uh, so that can lead to these incompetent valves, and an incompetent valve just means that the valve isn't doing what the valve is supposed to do. Okay, so so that can kind of kind of uh, progress to something. Now, if that clot is thrown, of course, we just mentioned that it can cause a, a pulmonary embolism. 
Um, and so, so that's what a DVT is, a deep vein thrombosis, kind of, kind of in the name. It's in the deep veins, because the deep veins are these ones that have the muscle pumps. You also have uh, more superficial veins. But these deep veins are, are these muscle pumps, and so when a thrombus happens in there, then, uh, then that can cause a lot of pain. Okay? And so you'll, you'll feel that, well, in the area of where it, where it happens. Okay, so symptoms, chronic pooling of blood in the veins of the lower extremities, and that's what, that's what occurs. Uh, what you might see is hyperpigmentation of the skin, feet, and ankles, and also you'll see edema. Okay, so edema of the lower extremities is typically where this happens, may extend all the way up to the knees. Um, and then complications, well, venous status ulcers, because you're not getting oxygen flow, you're not getting nutrient flow, maybe to those areas you're just kind of kind of blocking it off and those those uh, those toxins are kind of building up in that area which can cause ulcers and uh, an infection which is what we see over here okay we see an ulcer that's formed okay so veins and varicosity so so sometimes this can happen to on on more superficial veins and uh, so trauma to the saphenous vein that's that's trying to drain the blood from the from the legs um, could could cause uh, a noticeable effect, okay? So a uh, varicosity. And uh, so you'll see gradual venous distension. Distension just kind of means that it's that it's stretching out. Blood is pooling in there. You can kind of see in this picture down here where uh, it's supposed to be nice and smooth, but but because there's some kind of a, uh, um, a problem with the valve or returning the blood, whatever happens, we mentioned uh, trauma to the saphenous vein, uh, that, that it can kind of pool in this area and then you can see the, uh, see the effects of that, the, the, uh, the noticeable veins that are, that are kind of poking out from the uh, superficial areas of the leg. So pressure in the vein damages valves, unable to maintain normal venous pressure and you have venous pooling. So that's going to increase the hydrostatic or just pressure inside the vessel. It's going to increase pressure here and that and that fluid will start to leak out and it'll leak out into the tissue areas which is edema. Okay. So hopefully hopefully that that kind of makes sense. All right, so let's talk quickly about hypertension. I think most of us understand what hypertension is, and then we'll get into atherosclerosis, which is the leading cause of hypertension. Um, so it's kind of categorized in a couple of couple of different categories: uh, primary and secondary. Primary is what what we mostly think about when somebody has high blood pressure. Uh, that's the problem. The problem is the high blood pressure. So that's essential or idiopathic. We don't know what, what happened, how it's caused, um, and a lot of times we do, but it could come from genetic, environmental factors, your diet, those kinds of things, and that's most people with hypertension. The hypertension is the problem, and that hypertension can then go on to cause some other problem. Okay. Uh, secondary hypertension could just be hypertension because you've got some other disease that's going on. So if you have kidney problems, if you have kidney failure or kidney injury, then that can cause hypertension. That, that, that means that your real problem is the kidney. The secondary problem is, or secondary effect, one of the secondary effects is going to be hypertension. Uh, tumors can cause that. So if you fix the tumor, you fix the hypertension. That's really the way to think about it. If we can fix this, then we can fix the hypertension. Um, or, or drugs. Drugs can cause hypertension a lot of times. Okay, and then we have some, some normal, usually 120 over 80. You want to keep your blood pressure below 120 over 80. These, these can change, and we're not, gonna, we're not gonna worry about going through and memorizing these, but you can, you know, that's something you can look up. Now, um, so what are the risk factors? Well, we say constitutional, that's stuff that you really can't do much about. Your family history, your age, your gender, ethnicity, uh, diabetes can, can affect that, um, can affect hypertension. Lifestyle are things that we can do something about. Cigarette smoking, obesity, um, heavy alcohol consumption, sodium, remember sodium can cause increased fluid volume. All of these things, low dietary intake of potassium, calcium, magnesium, all of these things can lead to 
hypertension. And so these are the things that we have control over. So that's a lot of times going to be part of the treatment of hypertension is to, is to avoid those things. Um, okay, so now if things get really bad and blood pressure gets really high, and this is kind of a kind of an important thing to keep in mind, that just the high blood pressure itself can cause an immediate problem. Okay, so so we know that people have high blood pressure, and you know they know usually if they're paying attention that it can cause overall over time it can cause damage to vessels it can cause you know undue pressure on organs or undue stress on organs that kind of thing hypertensive crisis is a little bit different that's when the pressure is so high that we're talking greater than 180 over 110 or remember 120 over 80 is normal um, the pressure is so high that it's actually that the organs can't can't deal with that kind of pressure, and so um, it becomes an emergency when your blood pressure shows signs of end organ damage. And of course, it will. I mean, if you imagine putting the pressure in so much that you pop your organs, it's kind of kind of what's going on. And we know that when it gets to greater than, and we have here a diastolic value greater than 120, can be a uh, can be a diagnostic criteria for it or 180 over 110 but we know that that sustained pressure is going to is going to affect organs and it'll, it'll affect organs in different ways so it can affect the brain the heart itself cardio uh, the uh, uh, coronary arteries and the heart uh, large vessels kidney and can lead to hypertension encephalopathy. So this is when there's so much pressure in the blood that's going to the brain that it's actually causing fluid to leak out. It's pushing the fluid out of the vessels and into the, the tissue of the brain. So it can cause cerebral edema, which that can lead to seizures and coma. So that's why this is a uh, that's this is more of an emergent type of type of situation. So. Uh, something to uh, to pay attention to. It's not just you know if you see somebody with a one eight greater than one eighty over one ten, you don't just say oh you should not eat as much salt. This is this is kind of a uh, their organ damage could be taking place. Okay, so if you remember talking about aneurysms, there's a type of aneurysm. Remember we had the fusiform aneurysms, and then we had the Berry aneurysms. There's something else called aortic dissection, and it's pretty specific specific to the aorta. And, and it is acute. So when this happens, it's not just, oh gosh, we need to have this checked. It's an acute life-threatening situation because it could pop. Okay, so it could, it could pop, you're, pop, you're gonna have uh, 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 stasis, you're going to have uh, clotting formed that, that can form in that, in that area. So what is it? Uh, it's when the inner lining breaks of the vessel. So you have some kind of breach of that inner lining and it usually happens up here in the curve of the aorta. Okay, so, so going down to the descending aorta. So it happens up here in the curve, some kind of break in the inner lining. Okay, And so what that does is it allows blood to move outside of that inner lining and it collects and it collects in this area and it can keep collecting and it can become very very large. Okay. So it can become large, and uh, and and can clot. Okay, in that area when that when that happens, we call it a um, uh, a false lumen. A lumen is just an open space, and it's not supposed to be there. So I guess that's why it's called a false lumen. So involves hemorrhage into the vessel wall, or with longitudinal tearing, or separation of the vessel wall. So I guess that's saying that the small tear that starts out can actually cause more of a rip and and of course we can we can kind of understand how that can be life-threatening. Um, caused by conditions that weaken or cause degenerative changes in the elastic and smooth muscle layers. Okay, so because that's the layer we're talking about. Risk factors, hypertension of course can be a risk. Uh, degeneration of the medial layer of the vessel wall, so that makes sense too since the wall is the thing that's breaking. Uh, connective tissue diseases, congenital defects of the valve, stuff, stuff like that. So, so there are a number of different things that can cause it, but, um, but it tends to come on quickly. So clinical manifestations, abrupt excruciating pain, tearing or ripping, Okay, so that's that's what people are going to feel. They're probably at first going to think they're having a heart attack, 
but but that can be uh, that can be kind of eked out with uh, with uh, an EKG. So blood pressure is initially elevated, but later may become unobtainable in one or both arms. So you've got that collection of blood, and blood blood pressure is going to uh, can drop because of that. Um, so let's talk about quickly about some other peripheral vascular disorders. Now these are disorders that happen in vessels outside of of the uh, of the of the, the the brain spinal cord. So it's in the periphery. Okay, what we generally think of as the the periphery. So there's something called peripheral arterial disease, and this is kind of a catch-all, and it means that it's any kind of um, atherosclerotic blockage that happens anywhere that doesn't include coronary that aortic arch, okay, which is where we had the aortic dissection or the brain, okay, because these things are special. So you have the brain, which is a stroke, coronary is MI, and then the aortic arch can be, uh, well, kind of like the aortic dissection we just talked about. So it doesn't include those, but pretty much anywhere else. If you have an atherosclerotic blockage, uh, then that's just going to be sort of referred to as a peripheral artery, arterial disease. Now there are a couple of peripheral vascular disorders that are, are different from this, but they're still in the periphery. One of these is called Berger disease, or thromboangitis obliterans, and that is non-atherosclerotic, so it doesn't count as a PAD. So, but it's non-atherosclerotic. In fact, we don't really understand what's causing it, uh, but there can be thrombosis. There's some kind of suspected masked uh, clotting disorder. The important things to remember about this is that it, it tends to cause damage in the um, in the extremities, the feet and the hands, and we can see from this awful looking picture over here what the result can be, and it's often found in heavy cigarette smokers, young heavy cigarette smokers. This seems to be, in fact, it seems to be a disease of young heavy cigarette smokers. Other people don't tend to get this. Okay, so that's something to uh, to really keep in mind. So there's pain and distal arterial ischemia. So you're somehow blocking blood flow to the extremities. Something else called Raynaud phenomenon, and that is caused by vasospasm. So we kind of do know what's causing that. We don't know why the vasospasm is taking place, but that it but it does it blocks blood flow. And one of the symptoms that we see is white fingertips. And this may, this may happen when someone is, when it's very cold or strong emotion, so as we have listed down here. So something is causing a spasm. It's causing those vessels feeding the, uh, the fingers, primarily, and toes. Uh, whatever's trying to get blood flow to those extremities is somehow constricted, okay? So that's what we mean by, by a vasospasm. And, uh, and that's how you can kind of see it. You're going to have a decreased flow rate overall, but, but in this case, you can kind of see the white means that, that blood is really draining from it, but it's not getting to it, okay? Uh, we don't know what causes it, so unknown cause, so pallor, which is, which is the, uh, the whiteness in color, uh, numbness, sensation of cold, maybe. Okay, so let's talk about this big one, atherosclerosis. Formation of a fibrous plaque in the intimal lining of the large medium-sized artery, such as the aorta and its branches. So that's how we're defining it. Um, but really, it's this. If you look at the picture, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about plaques building up inside vessels. So that can cause clotting or ischemia in the coronary arteries, the cerebral arteries. Uh, so so that's, that's our real risk here. So we're going to talk about how this, these plaques form and what they're what they're made of because because this can be a, a major killer and it has a lot of secondary problems like stroke and myocardial infarction so we're going to go through quickly and and just kind of tell it maybe tell it like a story um, we have we know we have our vessels and we know our vessels have several layers okay so we're talking about arteries arterioles mainly here and we've also maybe heard of low-density lipoproteins, or LDLs. This, the low-density lipoproteins are considered your bad cholesterol. Okay, That's what people tend to call it, the bad cholesterol. 
And we also know that LDLs serve a purpose. They're supposed to be moving cholesterol around to different cells because your cells need cholesterol. I mean, it is considered a nutrient that, that your cells need to survive. You need it to make hormones, certain uh, uh, steroidal hormones like estrogens and testosterone. Uh, so, so we know that we need the cholesterol. So these LDLs are constantly kind of moving through your vessels hopefully minding their own business, but in some cases there can be a break or a breach in the vessels, okay? especially if you have you know, problems with high blood pressure to begin with. So, so there can be a breach and those little LDLs, some people have smaller LDLs than others, which is interesting, but, but the LDLs can move into from the vessel itself and can move under under that first layer of tissue and and that's not good because there isn't supposed to be anything there so let's just read this LDLs penetrate the endothelial wall and the tunica media of the artery following some kind of damage that happens okay so we don't necessarily always know what the damage was but we know that it has to be precluded by some kind of an opportunity for those LDLs to move under those uh, those layers of those inner layers of tissue well, now that we have LDLs under there, we have to do something about them. So your immune system is going to try to fix it. Okay, so monocytes are going to move under there, and they're going to treat it like it's a it's an inflammatory uh, problem. So there's some kind of a breach, some kind of a break. The monocytes are going to move in there, become macrophages, and they're going to try to get rid of those LDLs. So the monocytes are converted to macrophages, and they attempt to remove it. However, the macrophage releases oxidizing molecules like it's supposed to to break down the LDLs, but there's just, in my mind, the way I think of it is there's just too much. You know, there, there's too much cholesterol in there. And so, um, so what ends up happening is that LDL will kind of, kind of mess with the macrophage. And, and that macrophage, it, because it, and again, this is the way it works in my mind, can't handle all that cholesterol, can't handle the, the, the amount of lipid in the, uh, in the mac, in the, uh, that's, that's out there. The macrophage can't handle all that cholesterol. And so it turns, it turns into, the macrophage turns into something called a foam cell, okay? And, and, and it sort of loses its function. So these foam cells will, all good intentions of the macrophage, trying to get rid of those LDLs will start to form. And so foam cells, all these macrophages are turning into foam cells. And so what happens is a group of those foam cells turn into something that can be identified called fatty streaks. And so you can see that on the inner layer of certain arteries, okay, arteries and arterioles, wherever this takes place. So the first thing we see are these fatty streaks that are forming. And this is that attempt by the macrophages to clear the LDLs. Um, the foam cell releases growth factors and other inflammatory signals. And what over time ends up happening, so, so because this is an inflammatory process, more endothelial damage can take place. And eventually, I don't, I don't want to say, I, I, the way I think about it again is it sort of gives up and it says, okay, we're, we're not doing a good job here. So it starts to form these growth factors. These growth factors will, will start to form a cap around it and it tries to to cover it up nothing to see here so it tries to to cover that up so you can maintain some kind of functionality and so it forms this fibrous cap it has elastin in it and uh, and ultimately smooth muscle tissue grows around because remember smooth muscle tissue can divide and like skeletal and so it so it forms the cap okay uh, smooth muscle deposits calcium in it to make it hard and, uh, and that's why a lot of times you can get calcium readings of your vessels and you can kind of tell how much of this is going on because it happens to, to all of us on a regular basis uh, to some degree. Um, but yeah, so you have the smooth muscle, smooth muscle deposits calcium. So that's, that's what's sort of forming this, this, uh, this plaque around it or this, this, um, um, this cap around it and that can become a hardened cap. Okay, uh, stray factors and turbulence encourages thrombocytes to collect. And this is the problem. We've gone from having good blood flow in this area to now we have this turbulent blood flow. And when you have turbulent blood flow, 
it can cause it can cause pooling. So as the as the blood tries to kind of go around that, it can cause some some turbulence here and could increase the chance. Well, we know that it does. It can increase the chance of clot formation or thrombocyte formation. Okay. All right. So let's kind of go through it again. So the fatty streaks. Uh, it starts out with the fatty streaks. It occurs early before a true atherosclerotic lesion forms. So that's what we see first are fatty streaks. And you can see these sometimes in kids as young as 10 to 14 years old. Okay, so, so that's going to a lot of times be related to, to diet, obesity, those kinds of things. But these formation of fatty streaks is kind of an indicator that you're going to form atherosclerotic lesions. Now, the thing to remember is that the fatty streaks can be reversed. It is possible when this first starts happening for these fatty streaks to kind of kind of re re regress. Okay, that's the word we use there. Uh, so they can regress uh, or they can in continue to increase in number. Okay, um, then so after that, we have the progression, so from the fatty streak, the progression to the actual atherosclerotic lesion. So that's the collection of additional fats, proliferation of that smooth muscle tissue. It's, so now we're just sort of building, oh, there's a picture right there. We're sort of building a, a, a cap around this. And then, so proliferation of smooth muscle tissue and calcification within that fibrous cap, which is made of the smooth muscle and the fibrous tissue, the elastin, that kind of thing. Okay, so it's so it's formed a, a hopefully a pretty organized cap, but that won't remain. So then that can that atherosclerotic lesion can progress to something called a complicated complicated. I know that's a weird word for it, but a complicated atherosclerotic lesion. So things can get a little complicated. The fibrous cap can break open, which is going to form a hemorrhage, ulceration, scar tissue deposits, serious damage. And when that does happen, a thrombus may form, okay, again due to that turbulent flow and due to that vessel damage, you can start having platelets aggregate and you can actually form a thrombus and that's where things get bad, okay? So, so this complicated atherosclerotic lesion uh, is what's going to lead to things like stroke, heart attack, that kind of thing. Okay, so a couple of other terms. A stable plaque means that it's not complicated. Okay, stable plaque, thick fibrous caps, partially blocked vessels, yeah, that's not desirable, but but there's less concern, there's less worry because they don't tend to form clots or emboli. They're just the body's way of saying, okay, you've got too many LDLs and we're gonna do what we can. But they can become unstable, okay, and that atherosclerotic lesion can become complicated. But an unstable plaque is when it's getting ready to break. So they have a thin fibrous cap. They can rupture uh, to uh, cause that clot that we were just talking about. And in that case, it may completely block the artery or that clot could break free and become, become an embolus that we've, that we've kind of talked about as well. Okay, so clinical manifestation. Well, of course, it depends on the vessel that's involved. Uh, artery supplying the heart, brain, kidneys, lower extremities, small intestine, most frequently involved. If it affects the coronary arteries of the heart, it's an MI, uh, or it can become an MI, and, uh, and the brain can become a stroke. So ultimately what we see is narrowing of the vessel, okay? Hopefully that makes sense. If we're, if we're forming a lesion with a cap on it, it's going to narrow the vessel along there. And um, and then that can lead to sudden vessel, vessel obstruction caused by the plaque, plaque hemorrhage. Remember the complicated plaques? Um, or, yeah, complicated atherosclerosis. And, um, and thrombosis and formation of emboli resulting from endothelial injury. So it's just progressing. And aneurysm, aneurysm formation may happen because you've, you've sort of weakened the wall in that area. So you can form an aneurysm. Uh, so lots of lots of different things can come from this. It's not desirable. Atherosclerosis, especially when it's advanced, can be uh, can be really deadly. So if it if it forms in a coronary artery, it's coronary artery disease, which we're getting ready to talk about. Carotid or arteries in the brain, that's going to be a stroke risk. And then the PAD, the peripheral artery disease, is anywhere else, okay, except the aortic arch, brain, and uh, and coronary arteries.
Okay, so let's talk about coronary artery disease. Um, remember that the heart itself, I'll draw my Valentine's heart up here, it has to have blood supply to feed the actual muscles. Remember, it's working all the time, so there's a left and a right coronary artery, and then those branch, and the idea is to give blood flow and nutrients to the actual muscle tissue of the heart. It's separate from, you know, the blood flowing through the through the ventricles and the atria. It's, it's separate from moving through the chamber. We're talking about blood flow directly to the cells to keep that heart full of oxygen and nutrients that it, that it needs. If we block those, then part of the heart can die, okay? It's like a stroke occurring in the heart, or some people call the stroke a brain attack. But either way, you've blocked blood flow. So coronary artery disease, any vascular disorder that narrows or occludes the coronary arteries, which can lead to myocardial ischemia, so blocking blood flow. Okay, atherosclerosis is the most common cause. Risk factors, some of the things, again, that you can do something about, that you can do something about, and some things that you can't. You can't do anything about your age, family history, or your gender. Um, things you can do something about is control the lipids. Okay, so if you control the LDLs, then you're going to decrease the chance. One other thing you can't do a lot of times is control the size of those LDLs, and that's, you know, kind of a genetic component. But, um, but you can control LDLs overall with, with various diets. Uh, hypertension in general, from that vessel damage, cigarette smoking, diabetes. Uh, if you treat diabetes or if you avoid type 2 diabetes, that, you know, that kind of works together. Obesity, sedentary lifestyle, and then an atherogenic diet. So that's any diet that's going to not, that's going to cause an increase in the LDL uh, and so uh, really we look at diets that where you can avoid atherogenic so they kind of work against or with each other against each other whatever so let's talk about chronic so what happens when you have you have a partial blockage of coronary arteries and it's just sort of there okay so we have maybe some stable plaques that are that are there they have the fibrous coating but they're kind of compromising blood flow to parts of the heart so what can happen are the anginas so stable angina and this is kind of oddly named, but stable angina is from stable plaques. Okay, so we have a stable plaque. We know it's causing partial blockage. And this happens when somebody is out mowing the lawn. Okay, so you can kind of picture that. Somebody's mowing the lawn and they, they exert themselves just enough that the heart is saying, hey, I need more oxygen. This guy's really working hard. Uh, I need more oxygen, and the, and the coronary artery is saying, sorry, we're kind of clogged. And so those cells of the heart start to notice, and then that will generate pain. Okay, So that's pain when the heart's oxygen demand increases, and they're associated with, these fixed, the, with this fixed obstruction, so this, this, uh, these stable lesions. It's predictable. It always happens. I, I already used the example of mowing the lawn, but maybe... Um, walking upstairs, you know, if you if you know that when you walk upstairs and your heart starts to increase, the heart rate starts to increase, that you're going to start feeling this angina, and you can you can relieve that by rest. You can also relieve it by taking nitrates or nitroglycerin uh, to open up the vessels more, but but it's relieved by rest, and this is really an important point uh, because later we're going to talk about unstable angina. An unstable angina can't be relieved by rest, okay? So that's that's a blockage that uh, is from something more unstable, uh, an unstable plaque or something. Um, okay, so that's stable angina. A prince metal angina or variant angina is from a spasm, okay? So, so it's pain from uh, when coronary artery spasm. So it's really not so much associated. You could have stable angina too, but it's really not from... Uh, an increase in demand because it can happen when it, when you're at rest. It can happen at night. We don't know exactly why these vessels spasm when they do, uh, but when they do spasm, they can cause up to a 90% occlusion, which is going to be registered as pain. Okay, so that's that's variant, and that's why they're different. So if you if somebody has routinely and it happens more than once, then and they feel this angina at night. Um, or at rest, then we know that it's probably variant angina or, or prince metal angina, and it's caused from a spasm. Okay? If it happens under demand, it's a stable, stable angina. And we can kind of see a picture here. 
you can see that uh, when there is a spasm that occurs in this area of the vessel that we have just stoppage of blood flow to everywhere that was being fed by that. Okay, so that doesn't take place. And then if you take a nitrate like nitroglycerin, um, then it will cause that to relax and you have vasodilation that happens. Okay, so ovarian angina associated with pain and discomfort. Oh, I think I completely skipped silent ischemia. I did. So silent ischemia is not associated with pain. Okay, so no real pain. Okay, so you're not feeling any kind of pain. You may feel some discomfort, but or some fatigue, which is listed down here, but you don't, or unease, um, increased uh, breathing rate, but you don't feel the same kind of pain that you would feel with angina. Okay, so the cause is uncertain, but may be associated with mental stress and uh, and vessel spasm, but but you the person doesn't notice it, and they usually just notice it when they're um, when they're having a uh, like a stress test or some other kind of test being done. So ovarian angina is associated with pain and discomfort, silent ischemia. It's some kind of evidence that ischemia is taking place, but the chest discomfort and angina symptoms are absent. Okay, so that's just that's just what a silent is what silent ischemia is. This is just to point out to you that you don't always, and that's the important point, you don't always feel pain when there is ischemia of the coronary arteries. Okay? And that's silent silent ischemia. So uh, cardiac stress test can, can reveal this to be taking place. Um, and it's important because both of these, variant and silent, can uh, and, and stable, all of these can put patients at a higher risk for myocardial infarction and, and death. Okay, so those were chronic. Okay, so these are things that people experience for an extended period of time. Acute coronary syndromes, that's where we start thinking about heart attacks. Okay, acute fast onset, and it, and it develops very, very quickly. So we have a couple of questions here. Um, let's say we have an unstable plaque in a coronary artery, and it breaks free. Okay, So something, something happens, and it forms a clot. And we have a partial occlusion. Okay? I don't know why I changed colors there. But we have a, a partial occlusion that takes place, and you're going to experience ischemia. That's an unstable, unstable angina. You feel the pain. It's a different kind of pain. It tends to be more, uh, more intense. It can't be relieved with rest, and so, um, so, so that's what we consider unstable angina. So, an athero atherosclerotic plaque that is prone to rupture is considered complicated and therefore unstable. Unstable angina. Unstable angina may indicate that a plaque has become complicated but not yet necessarily broken loose. It's just causing some blockage, okay? It can be temporary blockage, but you know, when this is happening, there's a very, very good chance that a, uh, that a heart attack or a myocardial infarction could happen. Okay, so um, it's associated, and this is important, even though I don't consider myself an expert on EKGs, ECGs, this is an important diagnostic criteria, and that is it's associated with an ST depression. Remember, you've got the P, which is atrial depol depolarization, QRS, ventricular depolarization, and the T, ventricular repolarization. Not that important, but there is this segment between the S and T that tends to show what's going on, okay? If you are the T or the T wave itself. So, um, ST depression. So if you have uh, if you have a depression, instead of going up, it goes down. That can indicate ischemia, okay? Which is going to be associated with with unstable angina. So you have pain. You have you have T wave ST depression. Instead of going up, it's going down, and that's going to indicate yeah, it's going to indicate ischemia. Now. Injury is taking place, so that's going to be considered a myocardial infarction. Okay, so this is when when injury starts to take place, and uh, and you can also kind of see what's going. So so that means we have more of a complete blockage. It can I guess not be completely blocked, but it can still cause. But but it's you can get indicators that damage is taking place. Okay, so. 
Uh, it's a sudden and extended obstruction. Extended obstruction. So these these cells behind it are starting to to starve. Okay, of the myocardial blood supply, and you're going to be able to. So so there's either you can either have ST elevation. So going back to our EKG, we might see instead of depression, we might see this ST segment, we might see an elevation. That's what, that's what we can see here, which definitely, which definitely means that injury is taking place. Okay? So if we see an ST elevated myocardial infarction, that's what we're going to call that, an ST elevated myocardial infarction. There's really no question at that point that damage is taking place and that you need to probably get them to a catheterization lab and, and try to open up that vessel. Maybe give them some TPA. You know that there's a blockage and you need to clear that blockage because injury is taking place. However, what if you don't see ST elevation? What if, what if you see ST depression? Okay. Do we know that injury is not taking place? We don't necessarily know that. Okay. So now we have a question. You might be saying, well, non, if there is no ST elevation, why aren't we just calling it unstable angina? Okay, That's not really considered an infarction, unstable angina. There may not be any damage taking place at all, and that's the question. Okay, So, so if we don't see ST elevation, then we have some questions to ask ourselves. You know, is this an, is this an MI, or is it just unstable angina? Okay, Because the treatment's going to be different. Um, and really, we can tell that by, by lab, lab results. We can, uh, we can test for uh, troponin levels or uh, 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 creatine kinase, muscle brains, CKMB, and, um, and then we can kind of tell if damage is taking place. So let's kind of go through that uh, kind of once more in a little bit different way. So let's start with our unstable angina. The pain is different from stable or, or Prince Metal or variant. Okay, it's more persistent. It's it has a more severe severe course. Um, it can't be relieved by rest. Okay, so in fact, it may occur at rest. So characterized by at least one of three feature, features, it occurs at rest or with minimal exertion. So this is not our stable your your grandpa's stable angina. This is something more serious. Uh, usually lasts more than twenty minutes. Okay, unless you give nitroglycerin, which opens the vessels, which might help. Um, it's severe, described as frank pain, and of new onset. Okay? Uh, occurs with a pattern that is more severe, prolonged, or frequent than, frequent than previously experienced. So this is kind of saying that, okay, you've been experiencing ang angina, you've been experiencing pain, but now you know there's something different about this. Okay? Um, and that's what that's what happens with with unstable angina. Remember that that's that unstable angina is an incomplete blockage. You haven't you haven't blocked everything all the way, but you do feel the pain. Okay, and it's acute. That's why it's considered under this under this acute category. A myocardial infarction uh, general generally result from unstable plaques, just like unstable angina can, but your EKG changes can be different. So you can have the uh, you can have a T wave inversion, which is ischemia. You can have ST either either elevated or not elevated. Okay, but the important thing is that in this case you have injury taking place. Okay, so that's what's going to be our difference between an MI and just unstable angina is that you know that you have injury taking place. They're all going to be ischemic. Okay, you're all they're all blocking blood flow, but in this case you have damage with an MI, um, which infarction means damage, injury, necrosis. Okay, so that's why it's an infarction. So a STEMI indicates injury has taken place. So you would, in this case, if you see ST elevation, you know, you know that it's an MI. Okay, so you administer fibr fibrinolytics like TPA, tissue plasminogen activator. You want to break down the clot, and you would catheterize, catheterize them. It's very important to open that vessel because damage is taking place. Now, if you don't see ST elevation, you still don't know. You say, is this, is this uh, unstable angina or is this an MI? What's happening? So ischemia is occurring and injury is imminent, but you would have to get, you would have to confirm that maybe with lab results to see if there's actual damage. Okay, uh, if there if you don't see an elevation in these biomarkers, the troponin one and the CKMB, 
If you don't see an increase in biomarkers, then you say, okay, well, you can kind of indicate that, well, that means that, that cardiac muscle damage isn't taking place. The troponin 1 and the CKMB are supposed to be inside cells. So let's, let's kind of pause on that and say, why are we looking at these biomarkers? Well, these biomarkers are normal, um, are normal proteins that are, that are being made, but they're supposed to be contained within cardiac muscle. If damage is taking place, then these, the troponin, the, the CK, the creatine kinase, uh, CK and B, will leach out into the blood vessels, and suddenly you can see it in the blood. Okay, so that's that's why you know that muscle damage is taking place, and so that's going to be your indicator again for is this unstable angina or is this a non-STEMI? Okay, that's that's what we that's hopefully that that makes sense. I think I've said it twice now, so hopefully we got it. So what do you do? Um, so there are some kinds of revascular revascularization procedures. So you can put in a catheter and uh, install a stent. There are a number of dis different uh, uh, processes to use, balloon angiography, gra um, yeah. So, or, or in this case, we can see that you've put in a stent. You're doing something to open up that blockage. Okay, there's something also, also called a cabbage or a coronary artery bypass grafting, and that's usually if more than one coronary vessel is involved, uh, then you can bypass. You can bypass that area, and you can directly provide blood flow to the to the area that's uh, that's being damaged or is damaged. Okay, so let's kind of go over this one more time. Uh, acute versus coronary disease. So chronic. If it's chronic, then you have your stable angina. You have your variant or prince metal angina, or you may have just silent ischemia. Okay, so those are chronic. Those are things that are happening for a long time. Uh, Acute, when it's acute, you can have non-ST elevated, and if it's non-ST elevated and there is no damage, then we'll call that unstable angina, or if there's no damage taking place or no indication of damage taking place, we'll call that unstable angina. Uh, if there is damage taking place, then we'll just say that there, it's non-ST elevated myocardial infarction, okay, so a non-STEMI, okay. So that's, that's our diagnostic criteria for these. If there is ST elevation, and uh, then we know, and, and we can kind of look and we can say, well, is it, is it STEMI or is there actual necrosis taking place? That's going to depend on how advanced it is, how serious it is. But if there is ST elevation, then that's a clear indicator that there is damage taking place. Okay, so let's move we're going to also discuss the layers of the heart. So that was our MI stuff. Now we're going to discuss the layers of the heart. So there's this area around the heart called a, a pericardium. Okay, so it surrounds the heart. It kind of, well, we'll just read through the functions of this, this serous membrane that, that's kind of out here. Serous means that it's, it's producing clear fluid. It's lubricating for one thing, but it also isolates it from other structures. Okay, so that means the heart is not just going to kind of beating and just all over the place, that it's, it actually does have a membrane around it. Uh, main, maintains the heart's position in the thorax, pre prevents it from overfilling. Uh, it can be a barrier to infection, so it protects it. And it helps match the distensibility between the two ventricles. So both of these ventricles, the right and the left, both have to take in the same amount of blood. Okay, there it's different pressure, but if you think about it, they both have to be pumping the same amount of blood. Otherwise, things are going to get backed up, and that's where we talk about heart failure. Okay, so so uh, the pericardium plays a role in that, and the pericardial fluid prevents friction during systole and dia diastole, so it kind of um, lubricates it a little bit. So disorders, acute pericarditis. So we're, we're only going to really talk a lot about one of these. So, but, but that, that pericardial membrane can become inflamed, uh, and that would be an inflammation is itis, so pericarditis. So it can be uh, caused by infections, but it's in general, it's just the acute inflammatory process of the pericardium. So that's when it becomes inflamed. Okay, so you could, you could say that it's pericarditis, but you may not see any other any other uh, indicators like effusion taking place. So pericardial infusion, we have another slide on that talking about cardiac tamponade, but it's an accumulation of fluid inside that pericardial sac. 
okay? That pericardial uh, the layer, remember it's a, it's a bilayer. And so you can, you can see an increase in fluid, that serous exudate being, being produced, and, and it's going to collect around the heart. Um, there's also something called constrictive pericarditis, and that's where you've had damage and scar tissue forms, and it can make that pericardium stick to the heart. Remember, it's supposed to be lubricating and the heart's supposed to be beating within it, but if there's scar tissue developing, it won't produce that, that sera uh, like it's supposed to, and the pericardium can actually stick to the heart, and that's going to also restrict the heart's ability to expand. Okay, so let's talk about cardiac tamponade. Uh, it's, it's part of this uh, uh, pericardial effusion, so it involves the pericardial membrane, and it's fluid that collects in this. This is a Wikipedia picture, but I really like it because it really gets the point across. Uh, the accumulation of fluid in that pericardial cavity, okay, so you can kind of kind of see that. That effusion will lead to cardiac tamponade, which can be life-threatening and it compresses the heart. Now, now that kind of makes sense because you're not supposed to have a sack of fluid around your heart when it's beating, right? And if you do, it's not very efficient. And so, so it, can, it can really affect the ability for that heart to kind of expand into that area and it can put excess pressure on the heart. So that's really the problem. So it's this accumulation of fluid, pus, so it could be part of an infection or inflammatory response, or blood, so there could be something that's, um, that's uh, some kind of hemorrhage or something. So something is causing fluid to collect or in that pericardial sac around the heart. Now, there's something called pulsus paradoxicus, which is an indicator, and you can tell that it's, that it's, uh, that it's tamponade because you will see a greater than 10 millimeter of mercury decrease in blood pressure during inspiration. So when you increase, when you breathe in, your lungs expand and they increase pressure on the heart even more, it's going to affect cardiac function even more and it's going to cause blood pressure to drop during inspiration when you breathe in. And that's called pulsus paradoxicus. Um, and really, um, the cardiac tamponade is a, can happen during uh, coronary surgeries or trauma, okay, so that's going to be where that where that hemorrhage may have taken place, where infection may have taken place. So it does occur. We say not infrequent. Um, so it's either it's either it's not really frequent, but it's not infrequent either. I don't know. So, um, but that's but that's uh, that's cardiac tamponade. So other dis now we're going to talk about the actual muscle layer. Okay, so that was the outer layer. Now we're going to talk about the muscle layer. And so these can be categorized, uh, categorized as cardiomyopathy, of course, the myo referring to muscle. Okay, so we moved from the pericardial, now we're in the myocardium. Uh, so cardiomyopathies, and we're going to talk about two of these, dilated and hyper, hypertrophic. So, um, so dilated, and that's going to kind of take us back. So we're going to look at, look at that one first. And dilated, remember when we were talking about how when the heart is stretched out too much, that wall kind of gets thinner and weaker. Well, this is a, a pathology that, ha that where this happens, okay? So this, uh, so the chamber walls are thin, extended, or dilated. That's why it's called dilated cardiomyopathy. And weak, they can't sufficiently empty the ventricles and that leads to poor cardiac output the output from your heart is going to be reduced. This is the leading cause of heart transplants, okay? which I found interesting when I found that out. Leading cause of heart transplants, the causes can be a lot of different things. It can be genetic, it can be infectious, or we just don't even know. But we do know that it happens and, um, and that it's reducing cardiac output and it's a form of uh, heart, your heart is, will, it is in a sense, be failing, okay? And so it needs to be, in, like we said, it needs to be replaced. So you might see an enlargement, or you will see an enlargement because it's dilated. So the heart is enlarged two to three times with a flabby dilation of all four chambers. So instead of being thick and muscular and firm, it's, it's weaker and it's, and it's more loose, okay? of all four chambers. So manifestations the same as heart failure. 
So if you're talking about trying to move blood from the left ventricle and get it out to the body and it can't do it, then remember it's going to back up into the lungs and that's what we call congestion. Okay? So a lot of times it's called uh, congestive cardiomyopathy because, because it's, it's backing up, fluid is backing up back to the, uh, back to the lungs. That's a lot. All right. Uh, so also, uh, when you have any kind of interruption in blood flow, blood's not flowing the way it's supposed to, or it's pooling because it can't empty all the way, then, then there's a risk for small clot formation, some platelet aggregation, and then that can move on to become an embolus. Um, ejection fraction, less than 25%. Okay? Normally, your heart pumps out about half of the blood that's in the ventricle. In this case, it's only be able to pump out about a fourth. A fourth of the blood that's in, a, in the ventricle, and that's not a good thing. All right, so what about hypertrophic? Okay, okay, hypertrophic or uh, hypertrophy, left ventricular hypertrophy. So that's something that we hear about sometimes. LVH, left ventricular hypertrophy. This is when actually we go the other way. The ventricle walls are thickened. Okay. And when they're thickened, and you can kind of see it from this picture here, when they're thickened, there's less room for blood. Okay, so you might be thinking, oh, I've got a nice, thick, strong heart, uh, ventricle. Uh, but the trouble is that it tends to grow within to that, within to that cavity, within to the chamber itself, and, and it restricts how much blood can move into there. So your, your preload's going to be lower. Um, so abnormal diastolic filling, okay? That's, that means that you can't, during diastole, when the cardiac, when the heart is relaxing, you're not going to be able to pull as much blood into it. That's what we mean by abnormal, so reduced uh, preload. Um, arrhythmias can happen. You can actually see this sometimes on, a, uh, on an EKG. You might see a higher uh, QRST complex or the R, the R wave. So, so that, might, that might be changed. Plus, we're talking about you know, depolarization, repolarization all the way along, so it could actually interfere with uh, a number of different things. Uh, often associated with increased afterload from atherosclerosis. So, what that means is that as the cardiac, as the ventricle, we'll go up to the normal one here, is trying to push blood into the aorta, if you have some kind of stenosis, valvular stenosis, or you have atherosclerosis, but something is not allowing it to move through, that's going to make that left atrium, in this case, work harder. And if it has to work harder, it's going to adapt and it's going to become larger just like any other muscle that you work out. Okay? So often associated with increased afterload, so that afterload remembers that pressure it has to push against. Okay, So when it's genetic, it's the most common cause of sudden death in young athletes. So I often think about that because you, on a regular basis, you hear about a, uh, a student, a football player, tennis player, soccer player, somebody just dies unexpectedly. And a lot of times it's because they had a genetic form of this where the cardiac muscle was too large to begin with, and um, and it was undiagnosed. They didn't they didn't notice it. Uh, so it's uh, uh, autosomal autosomal dom uh, autosomal dominant trait. So the manifestations increased breathing rate, dyspnea, chest pain, fainting, and it's usually post exertional. It's when you're when you're putting it under pressure. Okay, so we went from the outer layer of the pericardium the, to the myocardium muscular layer. So now we're going to move to the endocardium. And we're going to focus mainly on valves, so valvular heart diseases, so stenosis of valves. So now our valves are supposed to open just right and then close just right as well. Okay, So as blood's trying to move through there, those valves are going to pop open and then they're going to close. And that's when everything is working right. However, not everything works right all the time, as we know. Otherwise, I wouldn't have a job and you wouldn't be taking this class. So uh, stenosis is a narrowing of those valves. So narrowing of the valve opening so it does not open properly. That's stenosis. That's just the, the meaning of the word stenosis. Now, we like to call this incompetent. We were talking about that with veins and incompetent, uh, incompetent valves in the veins earlier. 
but now we're talking about the heart, so it's kind of the same thing. The veins are incompetent. They're not closing the way that they're supposed to close, okay? So they're supposed to close it off and block any blood from flowing backwards. Well, if they're incompetent, blood is going to flow backwards, okay? And that's called regurgitation. If somebody like, or if your cat regurgitates, that means it ate something and then it puked it back up again, okay? So that's what these valves, I guess, are doing. The blood's going through and then it's puking it back up again. And so it's going the wrong direction. So um, so distortion of the valve, so it doesn't close properly, permits backwards flow to occur when the valve should be closed. That's regurgitation. Prolapse is when the valves themselves will accidentally, will actually go back the wrong way. They're supposed to open one direction and then close, but in the case of a prolapse, the pressure, you know, like if your ventricle squeezes, it could actually push that mitral valve back open the other direction. And then, of course, you're going to have regurgitation. Blood is going to flow the wrong way. Okay, so prolapse when the valve flaps are pushed in the wrong direction. Okay, so if we if we kind of look at some of these pictures, we can see the normal valve supposed to be open, then it's supposed to be closed. But a stenosis means that when it's supposed to be open, uh, it doesn't open enough. When it's regurgitant, that means that it's supposed to be closed, but it's still open. Okay, so that's an insufficient valve. So what are the orders, the disorders? Well, they're really based on those terms. Um, mitral valve disorders, mitral valve stenosis. Okay, it's supposed to be open, it's not opening up. Mitral valve regurgitation, it's supposed to be closed, but it's a little bit open. Mitral valve prolapse, it flaps the wrong way. Okay, so those are, so those kind of make sense. Uh, aortic valve disorders, so that's blood flowing from the ventricle. The ventricle squeezes, moves out through the aortic valve into the aorta. Well, that can be narrowed a little bit too, which, by the way, can lead to left ventricular hypertrophy. So stenotic aortic valve uh, or aortic valve regurgitation, it pushes actually back into, back the, the blood reverses direction okay we don't really see prolapse in that in that area because the uh, the aorta when blood moves into the aorta it's really usually not enough pressure to push it back the other direction but it can push some blood flow back through there if the valve doesn't close all the way um, the tricuspid eh, you know and pulmonary valves they're under a lot less pressure uh, the whole the whole right side of the heart is under less pressure and so they can get disease but it's but it's rare it's rare to see that for uh, for whatever reason, okay. And then I guess the the hard part about this, in this, in addition to just knowing the terms and what those terms mean, is figuring out how blood flow is affected by these valve disorders. And that's going to kind of move us nicely into uh, heart failure, which is going to be the next part of this.